Welcome back to the next episode of What's Up, Prof? Hello, Walter. We're saying hello again. Yes. This time for part two, right? Yes, continuing on where we left off on the previous episode. So I'll open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, once again we ask that you please be with us and help this discussion that we can discern what the Holy Spirit helps us and enlightens us. We ask you to bless this discussion in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, prophetic movements part two. Yes, I was thinking we could do it in one, but I think people will get tired if it carries on so long. Yes. So now we can, s the previous one we had more the political side and how it, everything, and what, like we mentioned, what's interesting is how in all these areas there's persons of a sp specific faith in, r in secret societies that's that are working together. Working together. Yes. So let's continue with this. Yes, to get the link back to the political side, I thought we'd take a speech of Mike Pompeo. Yeah. And he was speaking re recently about religious freedom mm. at, uh, in Rome. Yes. Although it's interesting that the Pope refused to see him. Yes. And uh, of course, this is a political game of dialectics, of, of ideological views. But be that as it may, uh, what is being said is rather interesting. Mm. And what I also find important is how the political side is pushing for the acceptability of the Roman Catholic principles and ideas and how Roman Catholicism is portrayed in a very positive light and Roman Catholic heroes are, you know, extolled as just too wonderful. So let's have a look at what he had to say. Now many of you know, when I was here last year, uh, I spoke about religious freedom at length. It was important for me to attend this year because the mission of defending human dignity and religious freedom in particular remains at the core of American foreign policy. That's because it's at the heart of the American experiment. Our founders regarded religious freedom as an absolutely essential right of mankind and central to our founding. Indeed, I would say it's an integral part to what Pope John Paul II described as the universal longing for freedom at the United Nations when he spoke in 1995. Nowhere, however, nowhere is religious freedom under assault more than it is inside of China today. That's because, as with all communist regimes, the Chinese Communist Party deems itself the ultimate moral authority. An increasingly repressive CCP, frightened by its own lack of democratic legitimacy, works day and night to snuff out the lamp of freedom, especially religious freedom, on a horrifying scale. I spoke on this topic last year for a bit, and I paid special attention last year to the Uyghur Muslims of Xinjiang. But they're not the only victims. The Chinese Communist Party has battered every religious community in China. Protestant house churches, Tibetan Buddhists, Falun Gong devotees, and more. Nor, of course, have Catholics been spared this wave of repression. Catholic churches and shrines have been desecrated and destroyed. Catholic bishops, like Augustine Shui Tai, have been imprisoned as if priests in Italy. And Catholic lay leaders in the human rights movement, not least in Hong Kong, have been arrested. Authorities order residents to replace pictures of Jesus with those of Chairman Mao and those of General Secretary Xi Jinping. All of these believers are the heirs of those. Pope John Paul celebrated in his speech to the UN, those who had taken the risk of freedom asking to be given a place in social, political, and economic life, which is commensurate with their dignity as free human beings. We must support those demanding freedoms in our time, like Father Lichtenberg did. But for all that nation states can do, ultimately, our efforts are constrained by the realities of world politics. Countries must sometimes make compromises to advance good ends, leaders come and go, and indeed priorities change. The church is in a different position. 
earthly consideration shouldn't discourage principled stances based on eternal truths. And as history shows, Catholics have often deployed their principles in glorious, glorious service of human dignity. The French Catholic philosopher, Jacques Martin, helped the lay, intellectual lay the intellectual foundation for the Universal Decla Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. In the wake of the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s, the bishops of Poland and West Germany led the way towards reconciliation between their countries. And every serious scholar of the Cold War now acknowledges that Pope John Paul II's played a pivotal role in igniting the revolution of conscience that brought down the Iron Curtain. John Paul II was also unafraid. He challenged Latin American authoritarianism and helped inspire democratic transition. Pope Emeritus Benedict described religious freedom as essential element of a constitutional state and indeed the litmus test for the respect of all human rights. And just like Pope Benedict, Pope Francis has spoken eloquently about the human ecology essential to decent societies. These examples, these remarkable examples of Christian action for freedom, justice, and human dignity shame those who are trying to drive faith from the public square. Pope Francis has exhorted the church to be permanently in a state of mission. It's a hope that resonates with this evangelical Protestant who believes, as the Holy Father does, that those of us given the gift of Christian faith have an obligation to do our best to bless others. To be a church permanently in a state of mission has, has many meanings. Surely one of them is to be a church permanently in defense of basic human rights, a church permanently opposed to tyrannical regimes, a church permanently engaged in support of those who wish to take the risk of freedom of which Pope John Paul II spoke, especially, most especially, where religious freedom is denied or limited or even crushed. As Christians, we all know we live in a fallen world. That means that those who have responsibility for the common good must sometimes deal with wicked men and indeed with wicked regimes. But in doing so, in doing so, statesmen representing democracies must never lose sight of the moral truths and human dignity that make democracy itself possible. So also should religious leaders. Religious leaders should understand that being salt and light must often mean exercising a bold moral witness. And this call to witness extends to all faiths, not just uh, Christians and Catholics. It's for leaders of all faiths, at, indeed at every level. It's my fervent hope that Muslim leaders will speak up for the Uyghurs and other oppressed Muslims in China, including ethnic Kazakhs and the Kyrgyz. Jewish leaders too will stand up for the dwindling Jewish community in Yemen. Christian leaders have an obligation to speak up for their brothers and sisters in Iraq, in North Korea, and in Cuba. I call on every faith leader to find the courage to confront religious persecution against their own communities, as well as Father Lichtenberg did against members of other faiths as well. Every man and woman of faith is called to exercise a moral witness against the persecution of believers. Indeed, we're here today to talk about religious freedom. The very future of religious freedom depends upon these acts of moral witness. It's now some 20 years ago, this very week, that Pope John Paul II canonized 87 Chinese believers and 33 European missionaries killed in China before the current communist regime took power. At the time, he said the following. He said that the church intends merely to recognize that those martyrs are an example of courage and consistency to us all, and that they honor the noble Chinese people. Brave men and women all over the world taking that risk of freedom, continue to fight for respect, for the right to worship, because their conscience demands it. Pope John Paul II bore witness to his flock's suffering, and he challenged tyranny. By doing so, he demonstrated how the Holy See can move our world in a more humane direction, like almost no other institution. May the church and all those who know that we are ultimately accountable to God be so bold in our time. May we all be so bold in our time. Now that was quite a long piece that we showed. But allow me to go to my Bible 
and to turn to Revelation chapter 13. Verse 11, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. Here is the Secretary of State of the United States of America, a Protestant nation, and he speaks like a Catholic bishop mm. in the Ecumenical Council. Yes. And causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. Mm. Did he not say at the end there that the Holy See is the one that has the capacity to bring the world, the morality, the morality into line with, with what the goals are? whose deadly wound was healed? I am astounded at the fulfillment of prophecy. And this is just the beginning. Mm -hmm. So here you have the leading statesman of the United States of America in terms of representing the message to other m nations. That is what the Secretary of State does. Mm. And here he is speaking at the embassy of the Holy See. And he is lifting up Catholicism as yes. the answer to the problems mm -hmm. in the world. He mentioned the whole time Pope John Paul II, what he did, Benedict, everything, Benedict Francis, everything of, of the, the Roman Catholic system. And he is displaying Roman Catholicism as a hero in the Second World War scenario with what happened in that regime. Totally neglects the rat lines, for example, where the papacy, via the rat lines, allowed all those Nazi elements to escape and resettle in South America and other nations. Mm. And... Uh, it's just amazing how one-sided this historic context is portrayed. Mm. But there's no doubt that what he is portraying here, and this is a very clever diplomatic game. Remember the papacy didn't want to, or Pope Francis said didn't want to see him. Yes. But he's acting as a spokesman for them. Mm. But it must appear as if it is not so. Yeah. This is Hegelian dialectic at its best. Yeah, I think the reason or from what I could gather, the reason that uh, Pope Francis didn't want to see them is because they are in... Negotiations. With China. Absolutely. Yes. So, yeah. so it's a very delicate game, right? But how far is this church and state movement going? And just to remind our listeners again, mm. when the Roman Catholic Church talks about religious liberty, it's your religious liberty to serve the common good yes. dictated by Rome. By it's the Holy See mm -hmm. that must dictate the morality. And it's interesting, you also mentioned uh, that Pope John Paul canonized a number of Chinese people, showing that the church is the one showing the direction of where it is going to go to. So as we said in, in one of our previous episodes, this confrontation between China Yes. And the United States is fascinating. And the military build up and all of that. But as Donald Trump said, we don't want blood in the sand. We don't want a war. But remember, the United States has the capacity to speak like a dragon and to force the world into compliance with the dictates of the Holy See. Yes. And isn't it also interesting, you also mentioned previously, that China is opposite the king of the north yes he's king of the south and here actually king of the north is calling for china to become part of king of the north come come part of come the system yeah, to capitulate to the king of the north the other interesting thing is it's always a mixture of judaism and and christianity mm, mm. the judeo-christian culture and we will see that in the next uh, videos that we will be discussing 
But our point is to show that the prophetic scenario is unfolding at a pace never seen yes. before. Now, it's interesting as we discussed that Pope Francis didn't want to see Pompeo mm. because they're playing this diplomatic game. And then, of course, there is of this challenge within the Roman Catholic Church of the liberal against the conservative side. And you have to ask yourself, is the devil divided against himself? Mm. Obviously not, yeah. right? He's not divided yeah. against himself. So what purpose does this game actually serve? Mm -hmm. But it's interesting that whether you're talking left or whether you're t talking right, they were furthering the aims of the papacy. Pompeo was furthering the aims of Pope Francis and saying that he was, you know, wonderful, wonderful in terms yeah. of what's happening. And then you have the conservative side. The Washington Times reports that Archbishop Vigano said Trump faces a biblical challenge against demonic forces of the New World Order. So there's that underlying game also taking place, yeah. that shift of power. Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano said the 2020 presidential election presents Americans with a biblical challenge against the demonic forces of the deep state and against the new world order. Uh, we said in a previous one that the king of the north and the king of the south sit at the same table. Yes. And what we see is actually what we are supposed to see. Mm -hmm. Presidential elections in November represent an epochal challenge a biblical challenge, the outcome of which will be decided not only for the United States of America, but for the whole world. He wrote in a letter offered but not read to Wednesday's National Catholic Prayer Breakfast. It is necessary that all of you Catholics of America are well aware of the role that providence has designed to entrust to your president, and that you are aware of the extraordinary battle that he is preparing to fight against the demonic forces of the deep state and against the new world order, the religious leader wrote. I am at your side with fervent prayer, together with millions of Catholics, with all people of good will throughout the world. That's very loaded statement. Mm. Goodwill means to be in harmony with the common good, right? Yes. The Archbishop also asserted that Mr. Trump is the greatest defender of the supreme values of Christian civilization, of life from conception to natural death. So this issue of abortion is very prominent in these elections mm. and in the religious morality debate. Yes. Of the natural family composed of one man and one woman and children, the Supreme Court pick is, of course, a supreme example of this. And of love for the homeland, one nation under God. So here within Catholicism, you have these two opinions. Yeah. That's Hegelian dialectic, playing off one against the other sharpening a synthesis eventually in the minds of people. Because mm. the alternative is, not is chaos. Yeah. He spoke on the roots of deviation of Vatican II and how Francis was chosen to revolutionize the church. What he's actually saying is that Vatican II, mm -hmm. which opened the doors for other denominations to come back into the fold, was a mistake. Yes. Only when facing the errors that started with the Second Vatican Council, the Archbishop explains, can we face our current crisis. Whosoever wishes to be saved before all things, it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith. Mm. So that's the one extreme view, right? For unless a person shall have kept this faith whole and inviolate, without doubt he shall eternally perish. 
Now, that is the, the view of Roman Catholicism in the Middle Ages. Then you have the ultra-liberal view, and somehow you have to find a synthesis, okay, something that you I can agree on. It, yeah. You've got this far right, uh, um, or not, no. I did, did, yeah, far right, but far conservative view, and then you've got the far liberal view that, that like you've mentioned. Yes. But now we have to go for a synthesis, exactly. and we have to join the Jew and the Christian. Mm -hmm. We have to join the liberal and the conservative Christian. Yep. There must be something that satisfies even them the all. Yeah, even the Protestant and the Catholic they have to join them. And it's interesting that Daniel tells us in, the, in God's word that music is going to play an mm. important role. And, uh, of course, the show and the theatrics that go along with it that work on the mind and work on the heart and the emotions, that's all going to be very important. So let's see exactly how this is going to unfold. We have to look at the theology of the important role players in this attempt to marry all these religious systems. And at the Washington Mall, there was a movement to bring religion to the fore. Mm. And it was called The Return. Yeah. And it was organized by Jonathan Kahn. Yeah who is a messianic Jew, right? Yeah, so he's, a, he's a rabbi. He was a, he's a rabbi and then he became Christian, so now he's a messianic Jew, but he's still a rabbi as he's well. He's still a rabbi. So the evangelical world and the Jewish world are combined as a unit, right? Now apparently what happened at the National Mall was, was viewed by millions of people, even in Israel, right? Yeah, around the world, yeah. But we have to look at the theology of Jonathan Kahn to understand where we are heading and where we are coming from. And we have to ask ourselves the question, is this theology biblical? So we're going to play a video where Jonathan Kahn is in discussion about his religious beliefs and how he sees the, the game plan for the end time scenario. It says after Messiah comes, Messiah's going to die, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed, but then it says this, and after 62 sevens, Messiah shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the, the, prince, the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will be with a flood. Okay, so what is that talking about? The people of the prince who is to come will destroy the Jerusalem, the city, and the sanctuary of the temple. Well, we know who did that. Who did that? The Romans did that. Yes. So what it's saying right here in Daniel is whoever destroys that city and whoever destroys that sanctuary, a, a, a ruler who's going to be of them in some way is going to come at, for the last seven. And who is that? That is the Antichrist. He is going to be linked to the Roman Empire. It's right there oh. in Daniel. You know. And so he's going to come, and then it goes further. It says, and then... It says, it says, he shall make a covenant with many for one seven, one week, one seven. But in the middle of the seven, he will cause the sacrifice and the offering to cease, and the, the, the wings of abomination shall come to the one who makes it desolate. This is abomination, desolation here, until destruction is poured out. So what's this all telling? This is just one little thing, and it, yet it's pointing to the whole end time scenario. Mm -hmm. the, the Antichrist will come. He will make a covenant for one seven. That's a seven year, that's the missing seven year period. The missing Shemitah thing, that seven year period. And he will make a covenant and then, and then there will be a temple rebuilt because it says there's gonna be a sacrifice. So the temple's gotta be rebuilt just by that. And then what else? In Jerusalem, so Jerusalem's gotta be back. Temple's gotta be back. And the Antichrist is gonna come there, make a covenant. And then it says in the middle of that seven, he will then, he will then cause it. The word abomination, desolation is in there, okay. So what's the middle of seven? What's the seven divided by, divided by two equals three and a half. Three and a half, yeah. So, well, three and a half is, a, is an incredibly prophetic. It all comes from here. Three and a half years. Everything, the two witnesses, three, everything three and a half years. It all comes from Daniel. It all comes from this, and it all points. This is what sets the whole stage 
for the end of the age. And the interesting thing here now, notice something, this whole prophecy is linked to Messiah's first coming, and it, and it begins with a proclamation by a world leader concerning Jerusalem. So if Messiah's first coming is prepared by a proclamation by a world leader concerning Jerusalem, then how about his second coming is linked to the proclamation of a world leader concerning Jerusalem, mm -hmm. like Donald Trump? Uh, I mean, it just happened. He's it another one. That's where we are right now. Because Cyrus was the first one. Yes. And oh, now we talk about goodness. another Cyrus. And how we, but to understand how important this is, the entire 77s are built on a world leader making a proclamation concerning Jerusalem. I mean, that is, that is something very big. Donald Trump is on a coin with, with uh, Cyrus. 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 <laughs> so here we are with a president who the Jews are even, they were asking Trump, and they say it publicly, help us rebuild the temple. And as a Gentile Christian, a Gentile follower of Jesus growing up, I thought Yom Kippur, or Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Tabernacles, had no significance for me at all. But I really believe, gentlemen, in these prophetic times, for such yes. a time as this, God is kind of lifting the scales from our eyes as Gentiles yes. and showing us the Jewish roots of our faith and bringing the fall feast alive. It's amazing to see. We are in the days that link up with the fall feast. And the, the great king, harvest. The, the king is coming. Great, yeah, the end time harvest and the king is coming. It's a mysterious day called Shemini. <laughs> Am I pronouncing yeah, pretty, it right? Pretty much. Shemini, Shemini. Atzeret. Atzeret. Yeah, people won't know about it, but if you look, it says, this, will, this is the mystery day. It's the last day, and, and, and it's a mystery day. It says, you'll, you'll celebrate for seventh day, seven days, then it says on the eighth day. Which is, wait, it says there's seven days, but then it says on the eighth day. Well, on the eighth day, the thing, the, here, what's eight about? I mean, it, by the way, the Bible doesn't say much about it. It just says you're going to do something. It's a mystery day. You have seven. What's the, the number of seven is the number of completion. Yes. So what's eight? Eight is what happens after the end. You know, seven is the end. But eight is what happens after the end. Shemini, et cetera, or means the gathering of the eighth day, is the day when they roll up the scrolls, the old scrolls, and they open up the new scroll. And, and it's also the day you take down the sukkah. Now, what is this all about? Well, if you read the end of Revelation, what happens? You, got, you know, the Lord's going to celebrate. We're going to have a celebration on earth for a thousand yeah. years. And then at the end, it says God rolled up everything like, the, like a scroll, the heavens, the old, and a new heaven. And a new, and it, so it's, it, it's eternity. The, the last feast or the last celebration of the Hebrew is eternity, it's infinity, it goes on forever. Now you had a very prophetic event take place that was related or linked to the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, and also listen, you know, some people say, well, where's, where's Rosh Hashanah, where's the Feast of Trumpets in the New Testament? Every time you read about the trumpets, when you read about the end, the trumpet shall sound and the dead will rise. The trumpet shall sound and will be gathered back. The trumpet shall sound and the king will come. It's all there at yes. the end. So yeah, yeah. well, I was, it, this was two years before 9-11. Now, now remember, the trumpets are kind of saying warning. They're saying, get ready because you're gonna meet God. Actually, it's called the day of judgment. So, so get ready, you got 10 days till, till you're gonna stand before God for your sins. So it's a warning. The trump is a warning also of judgment. Well, I was, I, I was led here in New York City. I was led to go two years before 9-11 to the Statue of Liberty with believers. And we were there because we, there was a sense that a, a terrorist attack was coming to New York City in the spirit. And we were praying and praying that something was gonna come. And I, I had the trumpet there and I sounded the trumpet and, I, and, and, I, and I, we blasted it and they took a picture where the trumpet actually is mark, is against the World Trade Center marking the exact spot where it's all gonna begin. And then we see a film, it's captured on film, where you actually see a plane doing exactly going to the exact course to that tower. I mean, it's like a foreshadow. And the day that it all happened was the Feast of Trumpets, which is saying, get ready, get ready, because, because judgment's coming and get right with God. Yeah. Well, if that wasn't fascinating, then I don't know what is. <laughs> what we have here is a futuristic outlook mm -hmm. where futurism is being brought into the fray. And what he is teaching is a Jesuit theology. Then you have the mixing of the feasts mm. and this particular Jewish feast, the Feast of Trumpets and uh, the Day of Atonement and all of these being brought in. And it's interesting that Vatican II determined 
that in order to link the religions, this is exactly what Christianity should do. So this has also been okay. determined by Vatican II that this must play an important role. And then the music. Mm -hmm. Vatican II also determined that music must play a prominent role. But we have to go back to the basics, mm -hmm. to where he started. The Protestant world clearly stated who the Antichrist was. Yes. And when we go to the book of Daniel, and we go to chapter 9 in the book of Daniel, there we have a prophecy where this man took a portion of the prophecy the last week and threw it into the future. And he's talking about the Messiah and the Antichrist. Mm. And what he is teaching is Jesuit doctrine, not biblical doctrine. So I don't want to go into details. You can perhaps put a link in mm -hmm. to mm. the lectures that we already have on, on okay. the 70-week mm. prophecy so that people can look at it step by step and in detail, but just for, for uh, clarity's sake. Let's just briefly go through this prophecy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. Now the decree of Cyrus and the decree of Darius, or Darius, as the Americans would say, were only concerned with the temple. Yes. Now, the Sexus's decree was concerned with complete political independence again. Mm -hmm. So this concerned Jerusalem as a whole. That decree went out in 457 BC. And it says, so the decree goes forth to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, and then it breaks it down, shall be seven weeks. That's seven times seven is 49, 49 years, and three score and two weeks. So it breaks it into two compartments. So the first part was the building of the temple and the restoration and the streets shall be built again and the wall and in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. Mm. In other words, the Messiah will die. So it predicts the death of Jesus Christ, but not for himself. Mm. So who was he cut off for? For the world. For me and for you, right? And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's referring to Rome. Mm. Rome came to destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of war desolations are determined. And now this is where they get confused, because they take the last portion of this prophecy and throw it into the future. Now, this comes out of the pen of a Jesuit because preterism and futurism are both Jesuit ideologies. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. So now it's describing Jesus Christ who will confirm the covenant with many for one week. That's the last seven-year period that we're talking about in terms of this prophecy. And in the midst of the week, that's three and a half years into this prophecy, in the middle of that last week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Now that he, they make that the Antichrist. Christ. But this is written as a chiasm. Yeah. Now the interesting thing is, when you make this the Antichrist, then you can come up with the theology, well, there must be a temple, mm -hmm. and that temple must have a sacrificial system, and that sacrificial system must be de desecrated. But this prophecy is about the Messiah, mm. and you cannot separate this final week. So we have to read it as follows. And he, the Messiah, yes. shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Mm -hmm. 
That's seven a seven-year period left of this prophecy. How long? How much time is there for you as a nation, as a people, mm. talking to the to Jewish the, to nation? Jewish, yes. And he shall cause sacrifice and oblation to cease in the middle of that week. Mm -hmm. So the final week, three and a half years, comes to the crucifixion. That's when Jesus ended the sacrificial system. Yes. Jesus ended it. Not, Not some antichrist. future antichrist. Mm -hmm. Jesus ended the sacrificial system because type had met antitype. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. So now you have a contrast with another he that comes in. This is a chiastic structure. Now you're talking about Rome mm -hmm. coming to make the temple and Jerusalem, the system, desolate. Even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So in the middle of the week, he puts an end to the sacrificial system. There's still three and a half weeks, three and a half days left. That means three and a half years left. What happened three and a half years later? Stephen. They stoned Stephen. Mm -hmm. And when they stoned Stephen, the gospel went to the Gentiles. Yes. In other words, the time for the Jews as a nation to be the heralds for the gospel had Amen. come to an end. But they jumble it up. And they make this a future Antichrist. So this is not a biblical doctrine. Now you're introducing all the feasts. Mm -hmm. And now you can look at what happens on these various feast days and you can try and couple it with an event, 9-11, and then another event there and a war here and a, an event there. Anything goes. Yes, and you also, that um, person in there, mentioned that Trump, uh, the, uh, the Jews asked Trump to help them rebuild the temple. The, exactly. So that's why because they have to fulfill this, this prophecy yes. uh, according to them. But actually they're going to fulfill a Jesuit prophecy and not a biblical prophecy in terms of our prophetic interpretation. We know that church and state must unite. So there must be a display so that people can get used to the idea and can internalize this, this vision, this theology, as you like. Now, at this particular occasion, where they had a prayer march, mm -hmm. they had the politicians there, Mike Pence was there, and he gave a tremendous speech on how everybody must join together and work together to further the goals against this leftist, separatist ideology. And you had Paula White there, and you had Franklin Graham there, and then, of course, the whole um, return had been organized by Jonathan Kahn, mm -hmm. whose religion and his religious views we just discussed. So let's have a look at the first one, where Franklin Graham introduces the issues. This is a surprise. We've got the Vice President of the United States of America, Second Lady Karen Pence, and I'd like the Vice President, Mike Pence, to say a word to us today, whatever God has put on his heart. Mr. Vice President. But we're honored today to be here at this Washington Prayer March. We wanted to be here to stand with you. But I also wanted to be here to extend the greetings and the gratitude of a leader who has been a champion for people of faith, for life and religious liberty. So allow me to bring thanks and greetings from the 45th President of the United States of America, President Donald Trump. And President Donald Trump, has observed many times that America is a nation of believers. And you proved that again today. Pray for all of our justices on the Supreme Court, including the remarkable woman that the president will nominate to fill the seat 
on the Supreme Court later today. And we just want to pray for them today. And we're so thankful. So I'm going to lead. And then after I pray, um, Paula White is going to come. And uh, she's been very instrumental in putting together a faith leadership team around the president. And then uh, Pastor Greg Laurie from uh, Riverside, California. We repent for our sin. We repent for the sins of our forefathers, God. And we ask you for the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ to cover us. Speak to President Trump's in dreams and visions, God. I ask that you would speak to him clearly by the voice of the Spirit, Lord. Let his ears be deaf to any voice that is not of you. But everything that is of you, let his heart be open and receptive. And God, I pray a supernatural strength that you would strengthen him physically, emotionally, spiritually spiritually in the name which is above every name the name of jesus christ god well what is important there of course is a protestant principle is that you are to be dictated to by the word of god mm -hmm. once you open yourself to dreams and visions and all of these they can have their place provided they're in harmony with the word of god but to be led by them is a very, very dangerous thing. Mm. That's why God gave us the word. And every spirit must be tested by the word. Yeah, and also what's interesting now with Mike Pence that was giving a speech, it's, a, it's actually, you can see church and state. Coming together. It's coming together. There's no s separation. And they're talking uh, the whole time about this that it was like William Barr said in the previous one, it's misunderstood that church and state wasn't, isn't meant that religion should be out of the state. Exactly. So this is now all happening at the Washington Mall. Mm. Now, interestingly, of course, the Washington Mall is actually an independent state within a state, yes, right? Yes, you, you had a whole lecture on that. It's actually Jesuit territory, uh, if you come to think about if it. If you come to yeah. think about it. Maryland, yeah. isn't it? Maryland, yeah. yes. Yeah, so now the prayer march was earlier in the morning and then the return happened a little bit later but with various um, speakers and preachers and everybody getting together. All right, let's have a look at what happened here. And I think this one we'll have to take piece by piece because it's... it's it was hard getting, uh, cutting out because you're talking about 12 hours that this ran, ran. So to show what is culminating, it, the video will be quite lengthy. All right, so we'll, we'll look at it piece by piece. for our nation and then for the world and then for the end time revival of which the scriptures speak. We've come here because we have been called to come here and we've gathered all because we were appointed to do so. For this is an appointed gathering at the appointed place at the appointed time by the hand of God. And this is the word given over two and a half thousand years ago that ordains how the sacred assembly of God is to begin. Tiku shall far be that see on God shoots on Kiro at Saran. Blow the trumpet, sound the shofar in Zion, consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly. This is how the solemn or sacred assembly begins, and we're going to do it live here. And this is how the Bible said, and this is how we ordain and begin this holy time.
right, so what do we have here, Martin? Well, well, we've got a mixture between Christian and Judaism. Absolutely. So we've mingled the two. There's been so much talk about this issue. Everybody says that this is the culture, this is how it works. So the two are pretty much mingled. Now remember the theology that goes behind all of this. So that also is not a biblical theology. We are to preach Christ and him crucified as our atonement. Now they do that, mm -hmm. but they bring in all the other things as well. Well, there were a number of, we said, political speakers. Ben Carson was one of the speakers. But all of them emphasized the Judeo-Christian culture. Yeah, and it's also just important to realize there was many people that were part of this. Absolutely. The president of the CBN, Christian Broadcasting Network, he was speaking. Uh, ben Carson, he spoke, and various other people from around the world and different um, denominations even. So they wanted to create this ecumenical climate and show that everybody is on board. Yes. This is on behalf of humanity yes. going forward. Now the keynote moment, a prophetic word to America. Jonathan Kahn. And we too have become our own gods. We have overturned the commandments of God. We removed them from the walls of our public square. We redefined truth. We created our own reality. 400 years ago, today, the Mayflower sailed through the waters of the Atlantic and a new civilization was brought into being and formed as a consecrated vessel for the purposes of the Almighty. But that vessel, America, has also forgotten the purpose for which it was formed and now wages war against them. How then can it stand? And how can God bless a nation that wars against his ways, that blasphemes his name, that silences his word and vilifies those who uphold it, that sheds the blood of over 60 million of its children? Can the smiles of, a, of heaven remain upon it? They cannot. Such things only lead to judgment. God told the prophet Jeremiah, take that vessel and show it before the people. And then... He says that the Mayflower arrived and this was to be the vessel that was to do the work of God. Mm -hmm. And it had turned its back. It had a, allowed secularism to come in. The Ten Commandments, he mentions them. Mm. He says we've put them aside. By implication, what is he saying? That it must come back. Aha. Uh -huh. And if you don't bring it back, by implication, what is his demonstration? Then God is going to turn his back on them. And the vessel, which is the United States of America, that is supposed to be the one that brings this mighty message to the world will be destroyed. Mm. Now, this is a real twist. This is a fulfillment of prophecy. America will make an image to the beast. Mm -hmm. America will speak like the dragon. And if we want to know how the dragon spoke, we have to look at the first beast. Mm -hmm. which was actuated by the dragon, and that is church and state dictating, dictating moral dogma. Yeah. America will do the same. They're striving for it. Mm. This is what the speech is all about. I have a question. Do you think that a massive occasion like this, where the vice president spoke, where political dignitaries spoke, where a lot of religious mm. m dignitaries spoke. Do you think a massive meeting like this will be left just to the whim of one man, like Jonathan Kahn? No. Or do you think that they are all in harmony with the message that has been brought here? Yes, I'm sure they have to be. You're not going to be speaking there at this if you don't say we're going along with it. If this. you don't fit into the message. 
Do you think they would have invited uh, you, Martin, to come and <laughs> give a <laughs> keynote address there? Uh, I doubt it, right? <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it. I don't think you'd fit into the picture. So obviously, this is an agenda. And this is an agenda that has been televised worldwide. And the message is loud and clear. We have to get back to values, moral values, mm -hmm. ten commandments. Mm -hmm. Again, let's ask the question. Which ten? Which ten? Mm. God's ten or papal ten? Mm. Papal ten, right? Yep. This power that according to the book of Daniel would change times and laws and certainly did it. Smash the vessel. For if a nation's course remains unchanged, so too will its end. For a house divided, a house that wars against its own foundation, cannot remain standing. And that is why we have come to this ground on the 26th day of September 2020 and have gathered all over America and the world because the hour is late. And that brings us to one last mystery. The mystery that lies behind this very day and this very gathering. When this day was chosen for the return, nobody realized, no one had any idea. It turned out that this day was a sacred day set apart on the biblical Hebrew calendar. From ancient times, it is called Shabbat Shuvah. Shabbat means the Sabbath, that's Saturday, which is right now. But the key word is Shuvah. What does it mean? Shuvah means the return. This day was appointed from ancient times to be the day of the return. This day was specifically consecrated as the day of repentance and return to God for the return of a nation, the return of all and each. I'm stunned. Can you take a prophetic word like that, throw it into the future and apply it in the way in which it is done here. No, it's not the right way to do it. No, it's not the right way to do it. You can do it, but it's not right. <laughs> it's not working. But what is he announcing? That this is the day when the nation will return mm -hmm. and do what according to them, it prophetically has yes. to do. But the Bible tells me that when they do that, when they set up an image to the beast, when church and state comes together, that it will speak like a dragon. Mm. And the dragon is not God. Mm. It is the enemy of God. There's a word appointed today to be read from ancient times. It is this, Tiku Shofar Bitsion Kadsu Tsom Kiru Atsara. What does it mean? Blow the shofar, declare a holy fast, proclaim a solemn assembly. Call together the people for a solemn assembly. That's what it says. Gather the elders, gather the ministers. Let the ministers weep and say, Lord, have mercy. This is an appointed moment. This is a prophetic moment. We are now standing in that assembly, that solemn assembly, and today in every part of this planet, in the synagogues of the children of Israel, the scrolls are being opened by the rabbis to that very scripture, and they're proclaiming all over the world, proclaim a solemn assembly. Then to support this message that the whole world is going to declare a solemn assembly. He brings in other prominent speakers mm -hmm. and they're going to confirm that everybody is on the same page. Yes. Now, Martin, what if eventually everybody does get onto the same page? And if you throw in the climate change mm -hmm. mix so that, you know, the secular world can also come on board. 
What if eventually a little group gets up and says, uh, excuse me, we cannot go along with that. Mm. Do you think you'll be very high in the popularity stakes? Not at all. Eh? Do no. you think it could lead to a persecution? Yep. Do you think that there might be laws that you become free game, as we discussed in our mm. previous episode? And that the people that institute that laws might be thinking they're doing God a service. Exactly. This is a very serious issue. Mm -hmm. So he's saying this is prophetic. And in, in a sense, he's absolutely yeah. right. Correct. He's absolutely right. Except that he's got the prophetic uh, exposition wrong. Mm -hmm. Because he's grabbing something here and grabbing something there and grabbing a festival and making it applicable to this particular day, this particular whatever. But the essence is that this is a fulfillment of prophecy. Yes. So let's have a look at some of the speakers who then support what he has to say. Before I ask you to pray with us, I want to thank everybody out there for showing up today. And I want to let you know that this is being live streamed to hundreds of millions of people around the world as we stand before you. So God bless you. And God bless you for all for being here. Hello, everybody. My name is Sam Brownback. I'm the U.S. Ambassador for International Religious Freedom. In 2009, I was a U.S. Senator from the state of Kansas, and I carried the bill to officially apologize to Native Americans uh, for their treatment uh, in the United States. That passed. The U.S. Congress was signed into law by the President of the United States, then President Obama, in 2009. But unfortunately, that apology was never put forward publicly to the Native Americans. And today we do that uh, with Dr. Nigel Big Pond present there, a friend of mine, somebody I've worked with on this cause for many years. We officially put forward this apology from the United States to the Native Americans of the United States. Well, I received this from the apology from the Honorable Ambassador of the United States of America, Sam Brownback, to the first people of the land. But along with this apology in 2006, there was a prophecy that God gave me, and I hope this, and I think it will come soon, that when the President of the United States releases this apology to the first people of the land, the hand of God will come across United States of America and the world in healing this land. All right, so you had actors mm -hmm. and basically Hollywood saying they are on board. Yeah. And then you had the ambassador, Brownback. Yeah, ambassador at large for the uh, rel International Religious Freedom Organization. And I've read that he has connections with Opus Dei. So here you have another inside Roman Catholic secret society mm -hmm. associate. Let's put it that way. And they are apologizing for the treatment of Native Americans. Now, there's nothing wrong with apologizing for the wrongs of the past, mm -hmm. which is a good thing. But then associated with it, you have, again, visions and dreams. Yeah, and prophecies. And prophecies, which, again, are an extraneous source, not associated with the Bible. So here, the leader says that when this happens, mm -hmm. this is when America will become great again. So this is when this culmination will take place. We are living on a knife edge. We are at the very point of the prophetic fulfillment of the, of Revelation chapter thirteen. Yeah. Definitely, right? it's do you it's see it? it? You cannot miss it. You cannot miss it. Let me just say, I just got it. We just got a word from Israel from a, a very famous rabbi there, and he said, we're all watching this in Israel, and it's shaking Israel, and we, we are so amazed by what you're doing on this day of repentance. 
Ronald Reagan was standing being inaugurated on that same ground that we prayed to. And there was a change in America, not about politics, but it was a call for, for spiritual revival. So I want all of us, we're gonna do this in a moment. I want you to join me if you're sitting and you can stand, not yet, not yet. Stand up and we're gonna lift up our hands and we're gonna pray for God's will on this election. Last Friday, another crisis hit America with the death of a Supreme Court justice. It happened on the eve of the Feast of Trumpets which is also the beginning of the 10 days of the return. And now the president has chosen on this day to come up with announcement of the next Supreme Court justice. He is at, on the day of the return at 5 p.m., the very minute when this sacred, this first part, the sacred assembly part is scheduled to go. We might go a little bit over, but it's all happening today. So what we are seeing here, Martin, is that again, they are using the calendar of the feasts to say that certain events will take place on these particular days. Mm. Now, you can of course arrange certain events on particular days as well, then mm. that doesn't necessarily make it prophetic, right? Correct. So we have to again say, the Word of God must be the one that leads us in our deliberations. Any other comment that yeah, you have? Well, also you mentioned Israel. A, r a famous rabbi was watching from Israel and they were telling them that Israel is shaken by this whole Absolutely. movement that's taking place. And isn't it interesting that he brought in Ronald Reagan? Yes. Khan said that he was present in the 1980 um, gathering that they had at the mall and they were praying towards the... White House and Ronald Reagan became president. And you just show, we showed in, the, in an earlier slide that Ronald Reagan and the Pope had this holy alliance. So Absolutely. It's all prophetic according to... So they also God. have a prophetic agenda. Mm. And it depends which glasses you have on. Whether you see the prophetic fulfillment in terms of the biblical scenario or whether you see it from the other side. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Hi, this is Dr. Satish Kumar, the pastor of Calvary Temple, second largest and world's fastest growing church with 300,000 members in just 15 years. And that Father God, that it's God's intent that the manifold wisdom of God be made manifest through the church and Lord, let that be released now in biblical year 5781. And the best way to bring the walls down is with this ancient instrument. And if you would join me, all the shofars, and if you would join me with a great shout that this middle wall of separation, that the Jewish people might reveal, be revealed, Yeshua HaMashiach, as the Messiah of Israel. Come on now. <laughs> And God heard our prayers based upon 2 Chronicles 7, 14. And God intervened. He had mercy upon America at that time. He raised up Ronald Reagan. Prayer movements began to develop. We saw a turning in the Supreme Court, the beginning of a turning. We saw Iran stopped in the threats that they were doing against the U.S. And Ronald Reagan stood in the gap and proclaimed that communism would come down. And it, it came down and 1.3 million Jews came back to Israel from that time. And now there's a revival in Israel from that gathering. So here we have confirmation again with Ronald Reagan playing a very important mm -hmm. part in the healing of the wound. And you have this revival, but it is a revival of confusion. Mm -hmm. Absolute confusion. And some are waiting for a Messiah. Some are saying it is the Messiah. Some are saying it is another Messiah. It's absolute it's, confusion. It's like Babylon. Now, that's what Babylon means. It means confusion. confusion. It's continued. This is, the, this is the act of the high priest of Israel. But you, the Bible says you are priests and we're going to do it together. What we're going to do is we're going to pray to the four corners of the earth and ask God's blessing to, for salvation, His will, and ready for revival. And we're going to start, we're going to pray for the four corners and starting with the West. So everybody lift both hands.
And let's pray for revival and for the beginning of revival, the preparation. So first, and whether you're here in Washington or around the, the nation or the world, join in wherever you are as we pray. Lord God, we lift up the West, and Lord, we have certainly prayed for America, but we ask again, Lord, have your way, be glorified here, Lord. Come, your kingdom, come. Now, we turn to the North. We turn to the North, and we're going to pray for the nations, the, northern, the, the nations of the North. And we say in Hebrew, I say, Asu Bashamayim. We actually, before that, Ritzoncha Viyeye, your will be done. Let's say it together, your will be done be done. Father, we lift up the nations of the North, Father, from Canada to Russia. We say, Uva Eretz. Well, as we lift up to the east, turn now to the Washington Monument as we pray to the lands of the east. As we pray for revival, there is one barrier that has not been broken down, and that is key to revival. 2,000 years ago, the church and Israel were as one in Jerusalem, but after that, there's been a separation and the Jewish people went one way without Messiah and the church went away from its roots and, and it lost the power of the book of Acts when they were together Jew and Gentile one in Messiah and it's been 2,000 years without that but now God is restoring that bringing back the Jewish people to Messiah and the church to Israel so we need to pray for that so we're gonna pray uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray on behalf of the Jewish people, repentance and blessing to the nations and the church. And Kevin's going to do it the, from, the, from, the gen, from the Gentiles, the nations and the church. So do you want to say something and then we're going to pray? Hallelujah. I just want to say that uh, Christianity was born out of the womb of Judaism. And America has a spiritual umbilical cord tied to the nation of Israel that can never be severed. Hallelujah. When Jesus said, your house is left to you desolate. desolate. That was the end of the Jewish nation as the proclaimer of the gospel. And the gospel went to the Gentiles. Now, the Jews can be grafted in, mm -hmm. but not as a nation, as individuals. Because if you are in Christ, then you be Abraham's seed. So here we have a union of Judaism and Christianity with different views of the Messiah. I prayed that the kingdom would come. Mm. What kingdom are they waiting for? In the previous, the previous one we showed, he was talking about the thousand year uh, peace on earth. Exactly. What is Roman Catholicism waiting for? A millennialism. A millennialism. millennialism. They're waiting for the time when the church rules on yeah. earth. In other words, a return to what happened in the Middle Ages. And uh, it's a return to what the Jews believed 2,000 years ago. Exactly. Or and still believe, actually. Rome ruled for 1,000 years without opposition. Mm. For 1,000 years, approximately. Mm. Then it received a mortal wound mm -hmm. after the Reformation had done its work. And now it is waiting for the next thousand years of its glory. But we're waiting for a kingdom whose maker and builder is God. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ promised that he would return. And when he returns, that rock not cut out by human hands will strike the statue. And the whole political system will come to an end. Mm. And the kingdom of God will be the one that reigns forever and ever and ever. So this is a different kingdom. This is a kingdom of a temporal millennium. Mm. Whereas we are waiting for an eternal kingdom that starts with a millennium in heaven, not here on earth. Yes. Because, where judgment takes place. Because nothing will be left on earth alive when Jesus comes and takes his bride. Nothing. to Jeremiah him. tells us that he saw the earth trembling, that there was no man, there were no animals, everything had been destroyed. The cities of the nations fell. 
This is a message of peace and safety. Yes, and sudden destruction is, is going what to follows come. It. And then I also just want to add to that destroyed earth, Satan will be on earth at that stage. And he will be desolate. And, and that's what, me, what Revelation means by him bounded for a thousand years. Now, when they preach this kind of message and with this excitement, and they're saying all the nations are coming together. And communism had to fall, right? Mm. So China will have to come into line. Yes. China will have to come into line. And we saw that now with Pompeo. Yes. He, that was what he was reiterating. That what was he was saying. So when they all come into line and when they all form this unity and they say, finally, we have solved this problem. And they turn against the commandments of God and implement the teachings of a system that has usurped its authority, changed the law of God, and asserted its authority over God and over the word of God, then sudden destruction will come. So people have to choose. You can run with this popular stream, or you have to make a decision and the Bible says, here are they that keep the commandments of God. God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Let's continue. The shofar in the scriptures, God ordained the trumpet as a vessel of his power. At the sound of the trumpet, the armies of God triumphed. The sound of the trumpet, the walls of Jericho fell down. The enemy would flee. The power of the Jubilee was unleashed. The blessings of God would break forth. And so now we're going to sound this seven blasts, seven trumpets. And we're going to believe as we pray for, this is the sign of his power, releasing of his power. We're going to pray. We're going to believe for the breakthrough of God, of everything we have done, the blessings of heaven. Seven times from here. And Lord, we, as we seal the return and the power of God, now, Lord, let the sound of your power go forth to the world. And yet, Jesus, Yeshua's name, go! Well, the nations are to hear that trumpet and the change will come. Now, let us just make it quite clear. Where did this take place? On the Washington Mall. And was it an independent ceremony or was it a national ceremony? It was an international ceremony. Aha, it was an, even an international ceremony. This is a fulfillment of prophecy. And now, we know that Rome has said that in order to glue all the various factions together, the charismatic movement was to play mm. a very important part. Yes. That's a Vatican II decision. Why? Because of the speaking in tongues. Aha. Uh -huh. Because you've got Catholics that can speak in tongues and you've got Protestants that speak in tongues. And that's why you've got the charismatic Catholic movement. Because, like you said, like um, climate change is the glue for the Sunday movement. Speaking in tongues is the glue for Protestants and Catholics. You have to glue the religious factions together. That's where the charismatic movement comes in. You can't on the basis of doctrine, glue them together. Because the doctrine is as diverse as is humanly possible. And then you have the climate to glue the secular arm to the religious arm, and then you have the full catastrophe together in one part. So now we have to look at some of those issues. So here is a video where Sid Roth, with a number of prominent people, is basically praying for the same thing. Mm. 
And it's fascinating to me that this man was also a Messianic Jew, how he brings the speaking in tongues into the issue. Let's, let's look at this. Cantor James Meyer blow the silver trumpet weapon. <laughs> we have God's attention, let me introduce you to our guests who will prophesy and pray in tongues for our nation. Why tongues? The crisis for our nation calls for perfect prayers and perfect faith that can only be accomplished by praying in tongues. This show is interactive. By that, I mean we need to all pray in English and in tongues. That includes you at home, too. I mean, really interactive. Pray as if it's life-threatening to you, your family, and our nation, because it is. Our only choice is President Trump. You must pray and you must vote. All start praying in tongues. You at home too. <laughs> Martin, I am speechless, but I think we have to say something in spite of that. Let me grab my Bible. Can I just say something before you start? Before I became an Adventist, I was in a charismatic church. So I do have personal sympathy with people speaking in tongues. I too. But if you really take time and listen to what the Bible says, then compare it with what, we've, what, what you know about speaking in tongues. Give you must actually give your testimony at some stage. You are trying to shirk the issue. <laughs> We're going to nail you down on this one. <laughs> I will. At, at some stage, I will. Did you ever speak in tongues? No. Me and my wife, we went to the speaking in tongues, the Pentecost um, week, and how to learn to speak in tongues, tongues and all of this. And I'll give a, uh -huh. a full version of that once on, another, on another, another occasion. occasion. All right. Is that a promise? Yes. Okay. <laughs> We've got him nailed down. If you want to define something in the Bible, you have to go to the point of first occurrence. That is the definition of what the phenomenon means. And the point of first occurrence is in Acts chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now here again you will have one accord in one place. Mm -hmm. 
and you're going to have a one accord in another place. And the two accords will be at opposite ends of the scale, and the one will persecute the other. So we have to know which one accord do we want to be part of, right? And then it tells us, And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So here you have the first occurrence, and we're going to have a definition of what happened. Yeah. And they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. I'm reading from the King James. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? That's the definition. Te mm idia -hmm. dialecto. In our own mother tongue. So if there were Germans there, they were hearing Peter or any one of the disciples speaking in German. Correct. Or French. Or French. Any, other or any other language under the sun. Now it actually gives you the names here. Parthenons, mm. Medes, Elamites, Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia. So here is a list of languages that were spoken. And it says here, Cretes and Arabians in verse 11, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. They fully understood. And in that time, the gospel had to go to every nation. There were a handful of disciples, mm -hmm. and God gave the gift. Now, the gift has sometimes been manifested in modern times, mm. and I've heard some amazing stories, the amazing stories in Africa, the story of the Bushman who got the gift of tongues and could speak the language that normally he doesn't speak. And uh, he discovered the truths about the gospel. There, there are many, many cases. In what fact, you know, mm. I've had reports of people listening to Total Onslaught mm. and hearing it in their language. And some people have told me this, but uh, I have no first-hand knowledge, so I'm not going to run with it. But it is quite possible that that gift is still being manifested today. But that's the point of first definition. Yes, and what was what's beautiful for me in, that ca in the case of the speaking in tongues at Pentecost, the, everybody was gathered together for the feast. So that it was from all over the world the people were there. Correct. And now the gospel had to go out to these people. So this, for me, th what's beautiful about this is at Babel, God separated everybody because of their transgression. Yes. And here he wanted everybody to hear the true gospel. So he himself gave the gift of tongues that people could understand again. Correct. That, that, that was just for me something that's beautiful. Now, many years that. ago I gave a lecture called Charisma of the Spirit. Perhaps you can put a link into right. that. It gives the Bible study. I can just briefly say that... Uh, they, of course, rely on 1 Corinthians chapter 14 for this gift of tongues. But this chapter is written as an antithetical parallelism. Now, what does that mean? You have a thesis and you have an antithesis, and you put them next to each other. So, two things parallel. One, how it should be, and one, how it should not be. Now, I'm not going to give the whole Bible study. You can put the link in. But 1 Corinthians 14 is not something that supports the modern way of speaking in tongues. It's one that actually negates it. 
Because the most important word, as far as I'm concerned in this chapter, is the little word but. Mm. Where he contrasts how it should be with how it should not be. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. Now people say that Paul is here saying what speaking in tongue is all about. But in actual fact, he's quoting a dictum. Mm. He was a very learned man. Yes. And he's quoting a dictum that was the common understanding of the experience that happened to Sibylline priestesses and priests. When they were overshadowed, they spoke in tongues. Mm. You find this in many pagan religions that people speak in the same tongues as we now have manifested amongst Christianity. And then he says, in verse 1, he says, Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. In other words, prophesy in terms of preaching the gospel. Preach the gospel. Then he quotes a dictum, and he follows it by, but... He that prophesies speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. So in other words, he's saying, not this way. No. Rather preach the gospel. This is not what we do. In fact, it goes on. He says in verse 9, So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For you will speak in the air. Mm. He's not for a gibberish language. He is against it. In fact, he goes even further and he says, if therefore the whole church, this is verse 23, be come together into one place and all speak with tongues and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that you are mad? So he's saying, speak a normal language. Mm. And this is what it was all about. Yeah, and even like he's probably um, referring, if you come into a church or a room and there's people speaking this one in French, this one in German, this one in Netherlands or whatever, you're going to say, what's going on here? Exactly. It's a so the bottom line is, I'm not going to do the Bible study in this now, but you can add the link to uh, the Charisma of the Spirit where it is done in detail. The whole letter to the Corinthians is a letter of rebuke. Mm. He is rebuking their practices. And one of them was. was the false use of tongues, which today is being reinterpreted in such a fashion as this must be part of the Christian experience or else you don't have a Christian experience. Mm. There's a quote in the Spirit of Prophecy, which I think we should look at. This one comes from the book A New Life and it says A spirit of fanaticism has ruled a certain class of Sabbath keepers there. She's talking about Sabbath keepers even that were misusing mm. the gifts. They have sipped but lightly at the fountain of truth and are unacquainted with the spirit of the message of the third angel. Some of these persons have exercised which they call gifts and say that the Lord has placed them in the church. They have an unmeaning gibberish which they call the unknown tongue, which is unknown not only by man but by the Lord and all heaven. Such gifts are manufactured by men and women aided by the great deceiver. Fanaticism, false excitement, False talking in tongues and noisy exercises have been considered gifts which God has placed in the church. Some have been deceived here. Fanaticism and noise have been considered special evidences of faith. Some are not satisfied with the meeting unless they have a powerful and happy time. They work for this and get up an excitement of feeling. But the influence of such meetings is not beneficial. When the happy flight of feeling is gone, they sink lower than before the meeting because their happiness did not come from the right source. 
The most profitable meetings for spiritual advancement are those which are characterized with deep solemnity and deep searching of heart, each seeking to know himself and earnestly and in deep humility seeking to learn of Christ. Martin, this is true religion. Mm. To make a bedlam of noise and to think that God has to get our attention by doing something specifically is actually misrepresenting the character of God. And let me think of your testimony where you said you were waiting for the priest because you couldn't speak to Jesus. Yes. So you had to first get the attention from, of Jesus through somebody else or through another means. Or through another means. By Absolutely blowing the trumpet. Absolutely right. So basically what we have here is a movement that is using the speaking in tongues to bring in the religious factions. If your experience is the norm, then the word no longer is the norm. The experience becomes the norm. And everybody that has a similar experience must have the same source of inspiration. But what if that source is not in harmony with the word of God? Yes, then it's from... Definitely from the other side. The side. Right? Now what's interesting is how all of these different views and are getting together in this. The dovetailing. Yes. Not everybody that were part of this return probably speaks in tongues. No. Not everybody that were part of this believes you have to keep the feasts. Like so but it's all mixed into this one. So you have a Babylonian confusion of many different religious manifestations. And this group says, I can identify with that. With that part. With that part. And the other group says, I can identify with that part. Some are actually repelled by some of the things that are going on, but they can identify with climate change. Mm. And so we are creating, or they are creating, a movement that has something to satisfy them all. And then for the sake of the common good, mm. they will find a common denominator upon which they can all agree. And as Jonathan Kahn said, the commandments have been put aside and the commandments are so logical that even the secular mind will be pleased if there are strict laws bringing morality back into this world. And even if he doesn't agree with the religious angle, he can agree with the social angle. Mm. And the Sunday, he has a way out because it can be environmentally based. That's what I just wanted to say. So and even if you're not at all religious. want to be part of this religious thing, there's still the climate that can bring everything together. And so you receive the mark of the beast. In the forehead, that means you are religiously in tune with the legislation and think that you are doing God's service by keeping the Sunday. If you are of the secular world, you receive the mark in your hand mm -hmm. Because you act accordingly even though you're not convicted religiously exactly. according. That's why it says either or. Either or. And not like God said, both. Both. Yeah. You have to have God's mark has to be in the forehead and the hand. You have to be convicted and act accordingly. May God give God's people wisdom that the issue is a war against the government of God. The issue is a war against the commandments of God and particularly the fourth commandment which stands for his authority. There is a usurper. The reformers said it was the papacy that was the antichrist system that changed the law of God, that changed the times. Even Melanchthon, already mentioned it. And it will be the issue of the final events. May we make the correct choice. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
The world is gearing up to set aside the precepts of God and to adopt the precepts of the papacy. I pray that you will grant your people wisdom to discern that the great ceremonies are there to distract the mind from the biblical realities. Help us to discern. Help us to see, Lord, that when the trumpet sounds and the music instruments play, that the great ceremony of bowing down to an idol will not affect us because the word of God has informed us and strengthened us and settled us in the truth so that we cannot be moved. Bless your people. Call your people. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe, click here. When the bell appears, click again to get notifications. To watch the next video, click here. Thank you.